do you guys like to go see? Do you like fish, by a chance? No. no. I, yeah, I don't know. I've never heard. I've never heard what they do. I think I've heard like one song, so I don't really know. I think they're really boring. Based on nice the guys, but they're really boring. Yeah. Ween performed "Roses Are Free" three times in the summer of 1997 until Fish covered the song in Rochester, New York, later that winter. Dean and Gene were initially so disgusted that they shelved the song for over two years. There's a really popular band in America called Fish, and they're probably popular here certain extent, but they, they kind of soaked up the whole Grateful Dead crowd after Jerry Garcia died, and they play some of our tunes. So the last couple of years, we've started seeing these like nomad hippies following us around just on that alone, you know. It's kind of funny to us, stinky hippies. <laughs> But on April 3rd, 1998, Fish performed a groundbreaking 27-minute version of Roses Are Free to a sold-out audience in Nassau Coliseum. Hi, I'm Amar Sastry, and welcome to Anatomy of a Jam. This is The Island Tour Roses. The worlds of Ween and Fish began colliding in the early 90s when Fish teased Push the Little Daisies at the historic Providence Performing Arts Center in February of 1993. At first glance, it seems that these two bands could not be more different with Ween embracing a purely punk ethos, their middle finger squarely planted on society's face, and Fish, who earned generations of fans that traveled in the world's largest hedonistic circus. But even from the beginning, there were a striking number of similarities between the two bands. Both got their start when two friends who met in the eighth grade began hanging out and writing and recording original music on multi-track cassette tape machines. Both grew up less than 20 miles from one another in the northeastern United States. Both slogged it out in local bar scenes, toured the nation thanks to word of mouth, and graduated to bigger venues until they were signed by Elektra Records. In an interview with Fishbase, Sue Drew, the a r rep who signed Fish to Elektra in 1991, recounted battling Fish's reluctance to sell out or get in bed with a corporation. She said, I quote, Frankly, I don't think Fish had any interest in signing to a major label, but at some point they came back to New York. At Elektra Records, we had a wonderful secret in our record cabinet. In those days, we used to keep copies of all the CDs that we had released previously. We'd have five to ten copies of everything, and it was an incredibly impressive roster through the years from Electra's inception until that time. So I brought them into the record cabinet, opened it up, and their eyes just popped out. Because everything from The Eagles to Tim Buckley to Motley Crue and Metallica and The Pixies, it was just an amazing array of talent, historically speaking, and current day. And I think at that point, when they opened that up and saw that, they might have reconsidered and thought, yeah, I want to be a part of this. Trey Anastasio directly credits Sue Drew and Electra for turning him onto Ween. Trey said, When we got signed to Electra in 1992 or 93, Sue Drew, our AR person at the time, gave me a copy of Pure Guava. Ween had also just been signed to the label. I loved that record from the second I put it on. And I remember playing it with my wife in my room in Winooski, and the two of us just cracking up. That was my first encounter with Ween. I thought they were incredible. Then I discovered God Ween Satan and went around the house singing Squelch the Weasel and El Camino for weeks. I was hooked. The interesting thing to me about Chocolate and Cheese is that it has some songs on it that really showcase the depth of their songwriting talent. Ween was recruited to Electra by the visionary VP Steve Ralbovsky, who during his career has also signed Soundgarden, Nancy Griffith, Anthrax, The Breeders, Kings of Leon, My Morning Jacket, Ray La Montaigne, The Kills, The Strokes among others. In an interview with Magnet Magazine, Dean recounted his sense of bewilderment and joy of joining the major label. One day, a box of pure guava discs shows up from Electra, and I started crying, because I was a music junkie, and now, here we were on the same label as The Doors. Here was this record that we recorded in our apartment for not even two dollars. We didn't even buy new tape, we just taped over demo tapes that bands gave us on the road, and it's on Electra. Roses Are Free is the sixth song on Ween's Chocolate and Cheese, which was the band's fourth album, but their first one recorded in a professional studio. 
The album's cover, which seems inspired by the Commodore's All the Great Hits, appears as a subversive, sarcastic symbol of the band's ascent to living life under a major label. Roses Are Free has a fairly typical verse-verse chorus pop song structure with an intro and guitar solo thrown in for good measure. In an interview with Jam Bass, Dean explained the inspiration behind the joyful, off-kilter vibe of Roses Are Free. Aaron wrote the song and recorded it in his apartment in Stockton, New Jersey during the very fertile writing period preceding Chocolate and Cheese. There was no bass on it. I immediately fell in love with the song and thought it was the closest thing we'd ever recorded to truly emulate Prince, who is our musical hero. The demo was on four tracks with two vocals, drum machine, and keyboard. I heard it as being symphonic. I think it's ironic that as many times as we've worn our Prince inspiration on our sleeves, that no one ever picked up on the obvious, massive Prince influence of the song. Fish are also deeply inspired by Prince, having performed 1999 and Purple Rain throughout their career, and having publicly professed their love for his music in print. Trey recently told Rolling Stone about an extravagant night in November 1996, when Fish was in town to play an arena in Minneapolis, and was invited to Prince's secretive Paisley Park compound for a party to celebrate the singer's release of Emancipation. Trey said, One thing I remember is Prince didn't serve cocktails, so in lieu of cocktails, he served little Captain Crunch cereal boxes. I thought that was the coolest thing. Trey mentioned that the highlight of the night was standing a few feet away, watching the purple-clad legend and his band performing through plexiglass gear. He continues, He was such a great guitar player, but people don't point out he was a great rhythm guitar player. The band was playing this funky stuff. He had a woman singing with him, a kind of gospel singer, and she stepped out and started killing it. He stepped back, and I remember thinking that everybody tries to play like James Brown's rhythm guitar player. Jammy guys do it a lot, and they all get it wrong, myself included. He was playing the most badass little rhythms with the drummer as soon as he got out of the spotlight. I was so fascinated by what he was playing. That's when I noticed what a great guitar player he was. Roses Are Free opened Fish's second set on April 3rd, 1998. From the band's body language, it seems that Trey called Roses, meaning that it wasn't necessarily planned or on the set list. We see him start the song, but the rest of the band doesn't immediately catch on to what he's playing. It takes a minute for Fish, Paige, and Mike to get on board. In the early days of Fish, set lists were often carefully crafted before a show, but that was no longer the case by the mid-90s, as we see here. The performance gets off to a rocky start. The band seems unsure from the very beginning, leaving a small but noticeable trail of vocal mishaps and missed changes. You can even see Trey internally chastise himself for missing the easy chromatic walk-up during the chorus. But with Fish, sloppy playing would often act as a catalyst, a transformative kick in the ass that pushed the band to play even tighter as the song ran its course. We see the moment that Trey decides that they're going to jam the song as he pummels 16th note B-flat power chords with downstrokes through the song's typical ending spot near the 545 mark. The what's going to happen feeling is palpable both on stage and in the stands as Fish rolls through Trey's power chords at the end of the song. The decision to take Roses out for a spin is cemented by an impromptu vocal jam as Trey simultaneously guides the band into B-flat Mixolydian territory.
At the 7.30 mark, Trey loops a small piece of ambient feedback that looms throughout the jam. This is a subtle move with big implications. The note that he loops is the note B-flat, the root of the jam, suggesting that he wants to dive in modally and not leave the harmonic vicinity, for a little while anyways. Page also switches to the prototypically funky clavinet at this time, while Trey clicks on his wah pedal and goes into full rhythm guitar mode. Both of these pieces of gear are quintessential sounds for funk, having been employed by countless pioneers of the genre like Parliament Funkadelic, Stevie Wonder, Herbie Hancock, James Brown, and of course, Prince. Trey even uses many of Prince's favorite guitar voicings and rhythms during this jam, including the minor 7, minor 6, and the minor 9 the holy trinity of minor funk chords. As Trey told biographer Richard Gere in The Fish Book, what we're doing now is really more about groove than funk. Good funk. Real funk is not played by four white guys from Vermont. If anything, you could call what we're doing cow funk or something. Trey, being the self-effacing musicologist that he is, may have also been making an allusion to cow punk, the country punk blend that eventually gave birth to both alt country and psychobilly. But cow funk, which began to take hold of the band in 1997, is notable since each instrument is relegated to a rhythmic role. The band collectively abandons traditional conventions of soloing and rather focuses on establishing an improvised dance groove without having any one member take the lead. This may seem like modern day jam band 101, but back in the mid to late 90s for a rock band touring the arena circuit, it was completely groundbreaking. Not all Fish fans enjoyed this style of jamming, which many diehards described as being neutered, directionless, and lazy. Especially coming off the heels of the fertile years of 1992 to 96, where the average Fish improvisation was a mind-bending roller coaster of virtuosity and effortless dynamics. But by 1998, the band had already had a year of experimenting with the cow funk style and started to break new ground again, as we'll soon see. At 8.10, we have more vocal jamming, and at 9.17, we see Mike going out on a limb. At 11.52, Page improvises a beautifully funky descending lick where he mixes B-flat Dorian and B-flat minor pentatonic, which ripples inspiration throughout the band. Experienced musicians understand that improvisation is a conversation, and that to really connect with the audience and your bandmates, you have to listen more than you play, which is exactly what each member of Fish is expertly doing in this jam. Trey can hear both Mike and Paige taking up more space, so he starts paring down his rhythm voicings from four note chords to three note chords down to a beautifully economic two note voicing. In the beginning of this jam, the band was largely centered around B-flat mixolydian and a B-flat 7 tonality. This just means that they're all loosely improvising within that mode in the key of B-flat. 
but Trey started playing B-flat minor voicings, which Page uses as a backdrop to improvise in B-flat Dorian and B-flat minor pentatonic. At 12.43, Mike takes that inspiration from Page and Trey and distinctly steers the jam from a B-flat mixolydian tonality to a B-flat minor tonality. He accomplishes this by repeating a syncopated B-flat minor 9 arpeggio ascending up from the third. Mike accents the minor third, the note D-flat, on the one, which is the first beat of each measure. The third degree of any chord or scale is crucial in determining the tonality of a chord. Major chords have a major third, whereas minor chords have a minor third. In addition, the only difference between the first mode of this jam, B-flat Mixolydian, and where we are now, B-flat Dorian, is that Dorian has a minor third. Since Page's and Trey's improvising are clearly defining the root, B-flat, this frees up Mike to accent the minor third, effectively and concretely pushing this jam's harmony into this new B-flat minor tonality. <laughs> It's clear that the band was focusing on their sense of groove and patience during this period, when at 13.13, Trey finally starts playing single notes. taken a full seven and a half minutes from the beginning of this jam until he plays something resembling a guitar solo, which is an eternity in the fish world. But instead of playing a typical improvised solo, we see him thinking rhythmically again, using repeating phrases as the other members percolate and shift their own repeated phrases underneath him. At 1347, Trey shortens his motif and plants the seed of a start-stop jam by leaving the fourth bar empty, allowing his bandmates to fill them in. Great improvisers often think in 4, 8, and 16 bar phrases, and we can hear the band collectively doing this. They think, play, and feel in 4 bar phrases as a unit, thanks to their time spent absorbing and studying the great musicians that came before them, as well as the multitude of improvisation exercises they practiced for years offstage. This whole time, we could still hear the band collectively improvising in four bar phrases until they all leave the fourth bar empty, resulting in a start-stop jam. Given the crowd's response, it was the musical equivalent of hitting a home run. Let's listen to the rhythmic space each member occupies in the minute leading up to the start-stop. It's Trey that's been leaving the fourth bar empty on his motifs, and one by one, each member catches on and mimics his use of space. We see that what seemed like telepathy is just the fruit of pure egoless listening. The 
jam takes another major turn around 1710, where Trey abandons his 16th note funk rhythm guitar work and begins experimenting with sparse triads. <laughs> They collectively explore and wander until water starts flowing through the hose at 1822 when Trey spontaneously composes a beautiful mysterious theme. The rest of the band can hear that he's in B-flat Dorian, and they follow and support him in kind until a moment of true telepathy happens. Page and Trey simultaneously land on the fifth of B-flat, which is the note F, at 1915. Once that happens, we can feel the sound coalesce like two massive magnets spinning around each other and smashing together. Page and Trey run with this moment, giving us a spontaneous modulation to the key of F. Trey quickly suggests F. Dorian and the rest of the band, like the true brothers they are, are right there to support him in F. Dorian. We can feel the energy in the room start to expand and lift as they drive this into a stunning crescendo that sounds like Keith Jarrett sitting in with Siga Rose. Fishman and Mike rhythmically weave in and out of time as Trey and Paige shower the audience with elegant crisscrossing melodies. Mike propels the band into a new section by subtly playing D flat and A flat, implying D flat major and A flat major, while Trey and Page are still in F minor. These three chords can either be viewed as being in the key of D flat or in the key of A flat, since all three of these chords exist in both keys. So what do they choose? Page suggests that they modulate to D flat by playing D flat major chords, but Trey entered with a melody based in A flat mixolydian, and the band falls in line and supports him. 
Now, D flat major and A flat mixolydian have the same notes, but the home base of D flat major is D flat, and the home base of A flat mixolydian is A flat. The band can hear Trey hinting at A flat mixolydian based on the chord tones he stresses, and they follow suit by adding supporting harmony and cycling melodies in A flat major. Trey also creates another interesting change in the jam, but this time rhythmically. His melodic line is loosely based in a 7 8 time signature, and the entire band hears that and lightens their grip on the more standard 4 4 time signature that the jam has been based on. The band collectively weaves in and out of time, which gives us that beautiful ethereal feeling like we're floating in space. But the fact that they're all slowly building tension in A-flat mixolydian is what gives us that grounding feeling of coalescence. Trey improvises leads that are both somehow fierce and blistering, yet soothing. He's improvising in mostly A-flat mixolydian and throws in a splash of A-flat mixolydian flat 6, which is the fifth mode of D-flat melodic minor for some added tension.
the entire band starts to collectively amplify the tension by playing completely freely, that is, ignoring the key, and in this case, ignoring any semblance of a pulse or time signature. We watch in awe as they joyfully tear down the castle they've spent the last 20 minutes carefully building. In a fit of controlled chaos, the wheels are falling off, and we love it. Chris Kuroda assumes the band isn't done yet and that they're going to take it even further out into space, so he launches the classic mothership effect. However, he sees Trey walk over to Paige and call the next song, so he respectfully shuts off the effect and gives them a standard wash so they can communicate a little bit easier. The band winds down Roses Are Free and segues into Piper. Ween and Fish have been heroes of mine for over 20 years. Both bands showed me that it's okay to be different. It's okay to be weird. It's okay to be unapologetically yourself. But that has to come with an uncompromising commitment to sharpen your craft, break your own perceived boundaries, and make your voice heard even if no one's paying attention. They gave me the gift of learning one of the most important lessons I've ever learned. And that's the fact that courage isn't the lack of feeling fear. True courage involves experiencing fear and acting anyway. So go out there and make something happen. Just make sure it's fucking beautiful. <laughs> <laughs>